All right, I think we're almost complete and that we can already uh, start off while well, there might be some uh, latecomers arrive in the waiting room, but I'll let them in then. Uh, welcome everyone to our uh, first guest lecture of our uh, course Chinese Law from a European Perspective. Um, and let me already extend a warm welcome uh, to our uh, first speaker of the course, uh, Dr. Mathieu Burnet. Um, before further introducing uh, our speaker, let me maybe first repeat some uh, housekeeping rules. Um, just to keep the connection as optimal as possible, um, I would like to ask all students to keep themselves muted um, during our guest lecture and also maybe keep your camera turned off. Um, that will allow the connection hopefully to be as uh, good as possible. Um, now I will be monitoring the chat box and the chat function throughout the lecture. If there are any technical issues, um, just pop a question and we'll try to um, resolve that as soon as possible. Um, then in addition, um, as you all know, the lectures are being recorded and afterwards, I think later today or at the latest tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to rewatch the lecture on Toledo as well. Um, if any questions um, arise during uh, Dr. Bernet's lecture, he's been so kind as to mention that you can just uh, pop up your question um, in a kind manner and then he will uh, definitely like to address it. Um, I think that was all regarding logistics uh, for now. So uh, without further ado, um, welcome again, Dr. Uh, Mathieu Bernet. Um, he is joining us from Belgium, actually, um, as he's uh, currently stuck in Belgium instead of London. Um, but he has been so kind as to agree to uh, speak with us today about uh, and put Chinese law in context for us. Now, specifically, he will do so by um, elaborating on uh, power institutions and values under Xi Jinping. Now, Dr. Mathieu Bernet is a, a senior lecturer in global law at Queen Mary University in London. Um, but he's also a visiting professor um, at Beijing Normal University and the Sorbonne, um, Paris, I believe. Paris. Um, now, notably, Dr. Bernet was also awarded a Jean Monnet Network uh, on EU China Legal and Judicial Cooperation in 2018, um, or better known as the EU Plant Project. Um, now, we're actually very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Bernet here today, as actually he's a um, he obtained his PhD from our very own Kai Duva as well a couple of years back. And he was actually also the driving force um, behind this very same course. Um, so he was uh, very active in shaping uh, the structure of the course uh, for the years to come. Now, um, Dr. Bernet's education is quite interdisciplinary actually. Um, he has a background in um, law, political science and history. Um, and obtained a double master's degree, if I believe, um, from Peking University and LSE in international affairs. Um, now, his research focus uh, or specialty lies in um, the study of the political and legal aspects of EU-China relations, um, as well as global law and governance and the comparative study of the rule of law in um, Europe and Asia. And actually all of these elements I think will come a bit um, uh, to the forefront in today's lecture. Um, now, without further ado, I would like to give pass on the word to you, uh, Dr. Benet, as I've taken already way too much time. But uh, again, a very warm welcome, and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Many thanks, uh, Melanie, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope that you can all hear me uh, properly. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to be back uh, in Leuven, even if it is remotely, even if it is online. Um, I keep a very good memory of the time I spent uh, in Leuven, including uh, um, by engaging with uh, students from different programs at the law faculty, but that also at the master, the master in European studies. So it's very good uh, to be here, and many thanks again to you, Melanie, and to Professor Walters for the very kind for the very kind invitation to contribute to this Chinese law uh, module. The purpose of today's lecture, as uh, 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 Melanie uh, put it, is to put Chinese law uh, in context. Um, the kind of menu uh, for today's uh, lecture is as follows. First of all, I just would like us to understand the movement or the dynamic which led us to the Chinese legal system that we know today. And for that purpose, I would like to emphasize first, uh, what are the sources and how has the development of the Chinese legal system 
taken place ever since the start of the opening up and reforms policy at the end of the 1970s. I would then like to talk about a narrative, a narrative which became increasingly prominent as of the year 2014, a narrative putting, I mean, the rule of law or the idea of ruling the country according to law at the very heart of China's governance system, at least in the discourse. So the very idea here will be to try to emphasize why and the extent to which the rule of law, the idea of ruling the country according to law, has become indeed an angular piece of China's governance system. Then obviously, when we look beyond the narrative, beyond the discourse, it is very important to take into account the huge shortcomings the huge shortcomings which still characterize the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective. And here I would like in particular to shed light on some recent developments. On some recent developments uh, which have taken place in progressively since Xi Jinping came into power uh, in the year 2013, uh, uh, um, uh, changes in China's policy, which have been described for good reasons, I think, as an authoritarian turn or an authoritarian revival under President Xi Jinping. Then in the last part, I would like to look a little bit and just to say a few words on the external dimension, namely, what do those changes, what do those policy and legal changes under Xi Jinping mean for the rest of the world? And in particular, what do they mean from the perspective of what has been described as a crisis of the liberal international order, not only a crisis of the institutions at the heart of the liberal international order, but also a crisis of the values, of the values at the heart of the liberal international order, including the values of the rule of law, human rights, and democracy. So let me start by explaining what I would describe as a reconstruction phase. A reconstruction phase of the Chinese legal system, which started at the end of the 1970s. I don't know to what extent this is something you discussed during the first lecture, but you may also know from your own uh, history classes, which you took during high school, that China was shaken by a very difficult period of time between 1966 and 1976. Between the 1966 and 1976, 1976, which is, by the way, the year when Mao Zedong, I mean, the, 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 the first, uh, 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 the, the creator, in a certain way, of the People's Republic of China back in 1949, this is the day when, the year when he died, when Mao Zedong died, that is in 1976. But between 66 and 76, China was very much characterized by a period of legal nihilism. We're talking at the time of the Cultural Revolution, Cultural Revolution during which indeed, not only were all legal, not only did all legal institutions uh, uh, collapse, but we could really talk about a rule of man type of situation very far from any kind of rule of law. And in a certain way, at the end of the 1970s, it is against this background that one should situate the need to reconstruct a legal system, not only by adopting new laws with most laws which had been terminated, but also by just rebuilding legal education. Between 1966 and 1976, all law schools were closed in the People's Republic of China. So in a certain way, at the end of the 1970s, there was this idea of reconstructing what had been destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. And this reconstruction should also be situated against the background of the idea of China opening up to the rest of the world. I mean, you may already have heard that terminology, the idea of opening and reform, which started in the end of the 1970s under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, and here I will just write his name on the chat, under the lead of Deng Xiaoping, there was indeed this idea that China should reform, that China should open to the rest of the world with as an ultimate purpose for China to develop, for economic growth to be sustained and uh, to be uh, increased. Uh, in, the years, uh, in the years to come. There was very much the idea at the heart of the opening up and reforms policy that in order to restore stability, 
in order to transform China into a more open and developed society, that there was a need to redevelop the, to redevelop the Chinese legal system. And this is what I mean with this idea of reconstruction, reconstruction phase of the Chinese legal system, which started in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and which can be characterized by three different phenomena. First of all, there was obviously the need to fill in all the voids, all the legal voids which were left after the termination of the Cultural Revolution legal voids which had to be filled in, in particular, in view of China's search for foreign direct investments. At the very heart of this opening up and reforms policy, you had indeed this idea that for China to become a developed society, that there was very much a need to attract foreign direct investments. And as you all know, in order to attract foreign direct investments, what you need is legal certainty. And the adoption of all those laws were partly aimed at achieving more legal certainty in the People's Republic of China. Obviously, it's not sufficient to have laws. You also need to have a legal and judicial capacity. As I mentioned, I mean, a few minutes ago, at the time of the Cultural Revolution, you had all the law schools which were closed. So there was very much this idea as part of this reconstruction phase to enhance and to, to, to re-establish a strong legal education system and also to professionalize the judiciary. And at the heart of the professionalization of the judiciary, you've had for a number of years, I mean, uh, the, uh, high, highly the establishment of a highly competitive uh, judicial exam, which is common to the positions of lawyers, judges, and prosecutors. I mean, we are talking about as many as 300,000 people who do take these exams now on a yearly basis. So proliferation of laws, strengthening of legal and judicial capacity, but also a growing legal awareness. A progressive legal, growing legal awareness, which means that increasingly there's been a public awareness that the law and the judicial system can serve as privileged instruments to resolve disputes. So what we've seen ever since the beginning of the 1980s is a permanent increase in terms of the number of cases being brought to Chinese courts. The story is obviously not that easy. It is not that beautiful. I mean, to quote uh, Mary Gallagher, I mean, we can talk about an informed disenchantment, an informed disenchantment to, in order to describe the perception that plaintiffs have of the Chinese legal system and the Chinese judicial system after having used it. So in a certain way, on the one hand, indeed, you have this recognition on the fact that the law and the judicial system may help address whatever kind of grievances you have suffered from. But very much indeed, when you have to go through this judicial system, when you have used this uh, judicial system, your kind of perception afterwards is very much one of an informed disenchantment uh, in terms of people having a reduced belief in the law being capable of protecting individual rights. So now the big question is, what, were, what have been the main sources of inspiration in this reconstruction phase, which started at the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s? And here, I just would like to make it clear that the, uh, the sources of influence have been very much diverse. Uh, I would like, first of all, to emphasize the importance of uh, international law. I mean, China is now a party to most uh, international organizations. I know that you will discuss uh, quite extensively, I mean, the increasing role played by China in global governance or the different attempts by China to shape international law with my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Wim Muller from uh, Maastricht uh, University, but it's also very important to look at it the other way around. Namely, the fact that international law and uh, China's ratification of a number of treaties, not least, obviously, the, uh, uh, um, the China joining the WTO, the World Trade Organization back in 2001, have extensively shaped, I mean, the content of uh, the Chinese legal system. I just would like also to flag here the importance of a number of uh, international uh, conventions 
just to take a few examples which relate to uh, contract law, which is, if I'm not mistaken, one of those areas of law which you will uh, consider uh, in the context of this course, the uh, UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, for instance, the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods has been, for instance, very much influential uh, um, at the time of the adoption of the 1999 uh, Hotongfa, the Chinese contract law. Um, the UN Convention has been, for instance, particularly influential in shaping the ways in which an offer is defined, or also, for instance, the validity of an offer is defined according to Chinese law. Another example of which are the Unidroit principles for international commercial contracts, the Unidroit principles for international commercial contracts, which is another type of international soft law instrument, which has deeply shaped uh, uh, the adoption and the content of the 1999 Chinese contract law. Now, I would also like us not to underestimate the idea and the influence of legal transplants, namely China importing some rules, some procedures, or some legal values from other legal systems. Obviously, when you need to start almost from scratch, I mean, the kind of tendency that you would have as, as a legislator, and this has been the case in numerous developing countries, is to look at good practices coming from, of, uh, coming from the outside. And as it was already the case at the beginning of, uh, at the, in the late 19th century or in the early years of the 20th century, when the Qing dynasty, the last empire, the last dynasty uh, of uh, China's history tried to reform itself, the inspiration in the process of opening up and reforms came to a very large extent from Europe. So the People's Republic of China, in the process of opening up and reforms, indeed found a significant uh, uh, source of inspiration in a number of legal systems from Europe. And again, to take the example of the 1999 Chinese contract law, the 1999 Chinese contract law is, has been very much inspired by the German uh, civil code, uh, for those of you, uh, I mean, who are from Belgium, uh, uh, and uh, uh, which has indeed also a, a, a civil law system and a private law system, which is very similar in a certain way to the uh, German, uh, uh, to the German uh, uh, civil law, the idea of good faith, for instance, uh, the idea of good faith, which is uh, a principle which has been borrowed uh, 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 from the German civil code in its paragraph 242, paragraph 242 of the German Civil Code, which defines what the principle of good faith is. Principle of good faith, which you can find in Article 6 of the 1999 Chinese contract law, which states that the parties shall observe the principle of good faith in exercising their rights and fulfilling their obligations. So this is just one of the many instances in which we have seen the influence of Western legal systems in general, but in particular European legal systems. Another kind of area of law which you may, I mean, study at a certain point, uh, um, at a certain point, in the uh, uh, um, it, uh, another instance in which we've seen these these processes of legal transplants coming at play in recent years, is in the context, for instance, of the adoption of the 2007 anti-monopoly law of the People's Republic of China, anti-monopoly law of the PRC, which follows very much the same structure and uses similar concepts to those of EU competition law. So if you want to understand the nature and content of the 2007 anti-monopoly law, it will be easier for you to understand its content if you look at EU competition rules rather than the US antitrust rules. So again, here, again, here we see uh, some legal transplants which have been uh, taking place. Um, did they, a question from the chat uh, from Killian, thank you Killian, did they also keep some former rules from the former Chinese empires or did they build up their legal system only based on foreign legal systems? It is a very good question there Killian. And uh, um, if you want to understand how the heritage of the late 
Qing, so the Qing dynasty, which was the last dynasty in Chinese history, which adopted a number of laws and even codes and made attempts of codification at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, it's probably better for you to look in the direction of Taiwan. I mean, uh, the kind of close links between, I mean, the laws and codes which were adopted uh, in at the time of the Qing dynasty in China uh, is uh, uh, have kept their influence more on Taiwan than they've kept their kind of influence on the People's Republic of China. Indeed, the first decision which was made back in 1949 at the time of the People's Republic of China was to repeal all, all laws which had been adopted at the time of the Republic, Republic of China, which was created back in 1911, on the very ashes, on the very ashes of uh, the Qing dynasty. Now, does, that, does it mean still that the only source of influence of the development of the Chinese legal system post opening up and reforms is to be found in foreign legal systems? The answer is obviously no. And hence my third point here on this slide, which is obviously the importance of Chinese characteristics. And for those of you who are interested also from a theoretical perspective into the process of legal transplants, it is always very important to take into account, obviously, the specificities, the cultural, the legal, the political, the economic specificities of the jurisdiction, which tries indeed to import those norms coming from the outside. So needless to say that there is a very large, there was from the very beginning of the opening up and reforms process, a very Chineseness at the very heart of this uh, reconstruction phase. Just to take, I mean, one example, uh, that is the idea of treating foreign invested uh, companies in a different way than uh, national companies. I mean, this very principle has been at the very heart of Chinese company law until very recently. And there we can see, I mean, some changes which have taken place recently. Uh, not least in view of the recent adoption of the 2020 uh, foreign investment law, which was uh, adopted by China, also in view of breaking the strong divide, which had existed to a large extent until then between foreign invested companies and uh, Chinese companies on the other side. But just to say, indeed, a variety of sources of influence have very clearly shaped the development of the Chinese legal system. Now, I just would like to say a few words on the narrative, on discourse. I should rather call it a discourse, which became particularly prominent as of 2014. For those of you who follow Chinese politics, I mean, you may have noticed that on a yearly basis, you have an important annual meeting of the Chinese Communist Party. This is called the annual plenum of the Chinese Communist Party. And quite interestingly, back in 2014, the very theme of this plenum organized by the Chinese Communist Party was ruling the country according to law, ruling the country according to law, which has sometimes been translated very often for bad reasons, as I will try to explain, as the rule of law. But quite interestingly, the law and the so-called strengthening of the Chinese legal system was indeed the main theme of the annual meeting of the Chinese Communist Party back in 2013, back in 2014. Let me just quote uh, Chinese President Xi, who you can see here on this picture, who said at the occasion of this plenum, to construct a rule of law in China, we must persist in moving governing the country according to the law, governance according to the law and administration according to the law forward jointly, and persist in the integrated construction of a rule of law country, a rule of law government, and a rule of law society. So this is for the kind of official discourse, but quite interestingly, I mean, also at the time, in the official press, uh, and as you know, I mean, uh, freedom, of freedom of press is very far from being guaranteed in the People's Republic of China. So we are here talking about an article which was published by the official a uh, uh, government-run uh, Xinhua uh, news agency who stated back in 2014, all the pains currently suffered by the Chinese economy, ranging from overcapacity, real estate bubbles, risks of local government debts and shadow banks, to restricted growth in non-public sectors and insufficient innovation, 
could find their roots in excessive administrative interference, corruption, and unfair competition, all of which are the result of the lack of rule of law. So you can see this kind of mood, right? Uh, this kind of mood, I mean, identifying the rule of law as the kind of way forward for China. So the idea that China should not transform into a democracy, but that indeed the rule of law could potentially be the way forward for China to solve the many structural issues that it was facing at the time. And to be fair, I mean, most of those uh, uh, challenges uh, listed here uh, in this article of 2014 are, I think, to a very large extent, still highly relevant uh, these days. Now, obviously, we are not here to abide or to buy, uh, to buy uh, this discourse uh, just like that. We are here to try to contextualize it. We are here to try to understand it as scholars, as students. And in that sense, I just would like us, before we try to understand the challenges or the shortcomings of the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective, I just would like to make it clear again what is meant by the rule of law. And I know that this is the kind of never answered question or open question that uh, is with you, that has been with you ever since the start of your uh, legal studies. And I can tell you that it will still be there uh, many years uh, afterwards. So my, uh, my purpose here is not to give you, I mean, a, a definite answer as to what the rule of law is or what it isn't. I mean, the first thing, very basic, which I would like to say is that the very idea of the rule of law is that it's opposed to the rule of men. And the very fact, indeed, that according to the rule of law principle, it should be the law itself, which is the supreme source of normativity, the supreme source of normativity to which the ruler itself, the government itself, shall abide. So the law as the supreme source of legitimacy, the supreme source of normativity, to which even the ruler, even the sovereign itself, shall abide. The literature, I mean, usually makes a distinction between two different types of rule of law. First of all, a thin understanding of the rule of law or a formal understanding of the rule of law, which can be described as the very basic conditions you would need in order to have a legal system. And here, I just would like to refer to the text of Lund Fuller of 1969 on the internal morality of the law. Uh, uh, Fuller, who identified the seven principles, which according to him, I mean, form the very basis or should form the basis of any kind of legal system. He listed the principle of publicity, non-retroactivity, understandability, consistency, possibility for practical implementation, stability, and the good enforcement of the norms. The idea is not only to have laws in the books, but also for laws to be properly implemented and enforced. As you can see, at the heart of those thin or formal understandings of the rule of law, you have no attempt to identify or to establish principles of morality or to defend a specific ideal of justice. And this is the main difference between those thin or formal understandings of the rule of law and what have been described as thicker more substantive understandings of the rule of law, which indeed includes some principles of morality, a certain ideal of justice, as it is, for instance, the case in the way in which the UN Secretary General defines the rule of law back in 2004, the rule of law, which he defined as a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. So here, you really see that according to the UN, the rule of law has some substance, that it relates to specific ideal of justice, which is that the rule of law and the legal system shall be compliant with international human rights norms and uh, standards. 
um, an additional document which you may want to consult if you were interested in the way in which the UN defines the rule of law is the high level declaration on the rule of law at the national and international level, which was adopted by consensus by the UN General Assembly back in September 2012. Uh, um, high level declaration of 2012, which makes it clear in its paragraph 10 that the rule of law, human rights and democracy are closely interdependent and intertwined concepts and values. So hence putting forward the idea of a substantive understanding of the rule of law. So this is it for, let's say, the kind of uh, conceptual uh, understanding of the rule of law. And before I turn to the uh, challenges uh, of the Chinese legal system from the perspective of the rule of law, I just would like to make sure that there are no questions uh, at this stage. I mean, don't hesitate to raise your hand or indeed to intervene on the chat if you have any questions or if anything, if uh, one of the points I've made is not clear enough. So again, really don't hesitate uh, to do that uh, uh, at a later stage if need be. Here, I would like us to discuss a little bit what I would call the shortcomings or the challenges of the Chinese legal system uh, from the perspective of the rule of law. The first of which is what you could call a very uncertain hierarchy of norms. I will talk about uh, 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 the lack of constitutionalism uh, in a moment, but uh, just to already say at this stage that the very position of the constitution at the top of the hierarchy of norms in the Chinese legal system is very much questioned. To put it bluntly, the constitution is clearly not at the top of uh, the legal of the pyramid of sources of law which govern the Chinese legal system. The main reason for that is indeed the fact that it is the standing committee of the National People's Congress, the National Committee of the National People's Congress, National People's Congress, which is the equivalent to the Chinese uh, parliament, which is indeed responsible for the interpretation of uh, the Chinese constitution, first of all, and secondly, due to the fact that very clearly the party, the Chinese Communist Party, is not submitted to uh, the Chinese constitution, Chinese constitution which was adopted in 1982, but I will come back to that uh, in a moment. Another point on which uh, I would like to, uh, which I would like to flag uh, uh, is indeed the uncertain status of uh, international uh, treaties. So for those of you who are interested in the study of international law, I mean, you may know that uh, 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 there is usually, I mean, two different ways in which, I mean, international law can become part of national law. I mean, there are two different theories of the ways in which international law interacts with national uh, legal system national legal systems, you first have the kind of dualist approach, a dualist approach which uh, does uh, indeed uh, consider the fact that international law and national law do form two distinct bodies of law. So this idea of a very clear cut separation between international and national law, this is the idea of a dualist perspective on the links between international law and national law. And on the other side, the more monist type of tradition, monist tradition, which foresees, which sees international law and national law as being part of a unified legal order. What the point that I would like to make here is not that the monist tradition would be better in any way than a dualist tradition or the other way around. The very point which I would like to make here is that China has not made a clear cut choice between a monist or dualist tradition when the relationship between international law and Chinese law uh, is concerned. That being said, it is very clear that in the very practice of the Chinese judiciary, that Chinese judges are very reluctant to make direct references to international treaties without those treaties having been translated in the content of uh, Chinese law. This is something which is particularly clear in the area of human rights law, where uh, Chinese judges never make any references to human rights treaties, knowing indeed that China has signed and ratified a number of international human rights law instruments, 
one of which is indeed the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which was signed and ratified by China. Just to flag here, indeed, that China only signed and did not ratify the International Covenant on Civil and uh, Political Rights, and for a variety of reasons to which I would be very, very happy to come back at the time of the Q&A, China is very likely not to ratify any time uh, soon. Um, in terms of human rights law, I mean, uh, and indeed the fact that Chinese judges do not make direct references to human rights treaties, I just would like here to make reference to the first white paper which has been published by the Chinese government on, uh, on human rights back in 1991, which makes it clear, if you look at the end of the paragraph, that a human rights system must be ratified and protected by each sovereign state through its domestic legislation, making it very clear that the purpose is indeed not to make direct references to international uh, treaties as part of China's judicial practice. So this is the first uh, challenge which I would like, uh, which I wanted uh, to mention. The second challenge is the one of uh, the lack of constitutionalism. The lack of constitutionalism, which I can only explain if I tell you a few words about the Chinese constitution. So when we talk about the Chinese constitution, uh, we are talking about the constitution, about the fifth uh, constitution of the People's Republic of China. So fifth constitution ever since the establishment of the People's Republic of China back in 1949. The first constitution uh, was adopted. Uh, uh, um, so, so you had the first, uh, uh, second constitution in 1954. Uh, 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 no, sorry, it's the fourth constitution, my apologies. Um, so uh, after the constitutions of 1954, 1975 and 1978, a constitution of 1982, which has been uh, uh, amended several times, included uh, in 2000, including in 2004, with with the introduction of a direct reference to the fact that the state shall uh, protect and fulfill uh, human rights, which was uh, included in the constitutional reform of 2004, but indeed another constitutional reform which took place in 2018, uh, which uh, to which I will come back when I will talk about a little bit about Xi Jinping. Indeed, it is at the occasion of the 2018 reform of the Chinese constitution that the limitation to two mandates of uh, the Chinese presidency was terminated. So until 2018, the Chinese president could not get a third mandate, I mean, as president of the PRC, but this limitation to two mandates has been removed, was removed uh, uh, at the time of the adoption of this amendment uh, in 2018. When you read, I mean, the constitution of 1982, it is very clear that uh, uh, it's, uh, th there is a very strong political willingness, I mean, at the heart of this constitutional, uh, at the heart of this 1982 constitution, uh, uh, con uh, a willingness, a political commitment to economic, uh, uh, to economic development. And uh, so this constitution of 1982 is very much to be read against indeed the uh, importance and centrality of the opening up and reforms uh, policies uh, uh, in the course of the, at the beginning of the 1980s. And what we also witnessed uh, at the time of the adoption of this 1982 constitution uh, was a decreasing influence of class struggle, class struggle, which was still very much the, the cornerstone of uh, the uh, former, the, the older versions of the Chinese uh, constitution. Now, it is quite interesting to see that indeed the Chinese constitution, uh, um, if, if you want to be, uh, uh, to make a normative claim here, does include a number of good things, uh, to put in a very, to put it in a very uh, trivial way. Uh, there is indeed the fact that chapter two of the Chinese constitution, for instance, includes uh, the protection or makes reference to the protection of a number of individual rights. That being said, the Chinese constitution has been described as a sleeping beauty, as a sleeping beauty by uh, the law professor uh, Ji Weidong. Uh, Ji Weidong would describe, I mean, the constitution as a sleeping beauty for the simple reason that you have no mechanism of judicial review. You have no mechanism of judicial review of the Chinese constitution, Chinese constitution, which remains indeed non-litigable. Uh, 
by non-litigable, it is meant the fact here that it is uh, very difficult to go before a judge and indeed to claim that uh, your rights have been infringed in view of the fact that the constitution was protecting that same right and that indeed the breach of the constitution would make you eligible for uh, the payment of any kind of compensation. So the constitution here is a sleeping beauty, it's non-litigable. And that being said, I mean, there were some hopes, there were some hopes uh, at a certain point in the early years uh, to uh, thousands that the constitution may become indeed litigable that it would be possible for, individual, for individuals to claim or to base, I mean, their claim on some specific individual rights protected by the Chinese constitution in the context of judicial proceedings before Chinese courts. And in order for you to understand what I mean by this hope, uh, I need to make reference to one uh, particular case here, which is the uh, Qi Yuling, uh, which is the Qi Yuling case, in which the Supreme People's Court, the Supreme People's Court, which is the highest level of jurisdiction in the PRC, made a direct reference to a constitutional right back in 2001 made a direct reference to a constitutional right, constitutional right, which is uh, protected by Article uh, 46 of the Chinese constitution, Article 46 of the Chinese constitution, which states that every individual in China has the right to have access to education as the right to education. So right to education, which is in court in Article 46 of the Chinese constitution. Now, let me tell you a little bit the story of a student. Her name was Chi Yuling. And for you to understand, I mean, the situation of this student, you, I need to flag uh, probably, I mean, a big difference between uh, the education system of the People's Republic of China with the education systems that probably most of you know, whether you come from Belgium or from any other European countries or from the US or uh, uh, many other countries in the world. The very fact is that to enter, I mean, Chinese universities and to enter top Chinese universities, the process is way more competitive. It's extremely competitive. It's extremely competitive in the sense that at the end of high school, you need to take a kind of national exam, national uh, results, uh, uh, or, um, and the results of your, uh, you, you will get at this national exam will very much condition your ability or uh, the impossibility for you to enter the top uh, Chinese universities. So let's say that Qi Yuling, I mean, uh, uh, did very well at the occasion of this exam. She received, I mean, a couple of offers to enter, I mean, some good universities in the PRC, but she decided to take a gap year. She decided that it was too soon for her to enter the university and she decided to postpone uh, her entry to the university by one year. But the fact is that in the meantime, her identity got stolen. Her identity got stolen by another student who did pretend to be Qi Yuling and who stole or who infringed, according to the real Qi Yuling, a right to education. Indeed, she said that she was Qi Yuling and she entered that, in, that, the, that university in place of the real Qi Yuling. So what Qi Yuling did is that she brought a case to the court saying that her right to education had been infringed and she asked for compensations. She asked for compensations in view of her identity being stolen and a right to a fair, to a right to education and to higher education having been stolen by that other uh, individual. The Supreme People's Court, quite interestingly, indeed decided to make the defendant liable. Decided to make the defendant liable to compensate for the damages caused, damages caused indeed by the fact. Article 46 of the Chinese constitution had been infringed. As you can easily imagine, I mean, the world of Chinese or of constitutional lawyers who have an interest in the study of Chinese law, everyone was there, wow, what a change. What a change. It actually means now that the constitution is no longer sleeping beauty, that it can be enforced, that there is a mechanism of judicial review. A few years after that case, the Supreme People's Court released the so-called notice, so-called notice of the Supreme People's Court saying that 
the Chiyulin case was no longer of application. This was the end of the story of this hope of China taking the path of constitutionalism. This was the end of the hope of the Chinese constitution becoming litigable and no longer being a sleeping beauty. Now, you may tell me, but what is then the point of talking about the Chinese constitution? Here, and this leads me in a certain way to uh, my next point. My next point, which is about emphasizing the influence which a constitution can have beyond the judicial system. So even if the constitution is non-litigable, even if you have no mechanism of judicial review, does it mean that the constitution is meaningless? No, not in the Chinese context. What you see, what you have seen, I mean, in recent years is a movement of constitutional activism. Constitutional activism, which unfolds in a certain way in the following way, that is that you have individuals, civil society organizations, and I will be talking about civil society organizations in the second half of this lecture, civil CSOs, which have literally a shrinking space for dissent under Xi Jinping. But still, you have this piece of paper. You have this piece of paper called the Chinese constitution. And what you see are individuals of organizations making reference to the Chinese constitution. And I just would like here to take one example, one example, which is the one of the so-called Hukou, Hukou editorial. Hukou editorial, which was uh, published by uh, 13 Chinese new papers to denounce the well-known Hukou system and asked for significantly reforming it. So here maybe, and, and I know it's difficult in this kind of online environment, but any, does anyone in the room knows, know what the hukou system is all about in China or the system of household registration to translate it? So the hukou system or the household registration system uh, in China. Uh, someone on the chat, is this the internal passport? Yeah, if you like. Can you maybe spell that out, Killian? I mean, don't hesitate to unmute uh, if you if you like uh, to explain what it is about. Uh, I think like everybody in the country has to um, so so called register and mm -hmm. then to have an ID card in order to be able to cross the country and so on. Excellent. I mean, it is all good, Kilian, and thanks, Rebecca, indeed, for uh, this reference to the distinction between urban versus uh, rural inhabitants. This is very much linked to it. So the hukou system is a system of household registration that will identify a person as residing in a specific area. So we are talking here about the registration system that will identify you as an individual residing in a specific area. And depending on what your household registration says, or to use Rebecca's words, on whether, I mean, you have an urban or rural hukou, an urban or rural household registration, you will have different rights. You will have different rights in terms of being able to work and live where it suits you meaning that your very mobility within the country, within the People's Republic of China, is very much restrained by this hukou system. Hukou system, which is in, in a pro, currently in a process of reforms, but to be honest, I mean, the very implications of this hukou system as, are still very much to be seen, namely in terms of having this so-called floating population, a uh, floating population of migrant workers, migrant workers, which are around 200 million in China, namely people who decide to leave, I mean, the countryside or to leave more rural areas to work in more urban areas without having the right to work or to live in those cities according to their hukou, according to their household registration. So if you want to understand what you could call the uh, 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 internal migration process, so what 
who are the internal migrants within the People's Republic of China, uh, you need to understand what the hukou system is all about. And the reason why I wanted to talk about the hukou system is because a few years ago, and uh, sorry, I forgot to write down the date here. Uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2013, but I will check during the break. I mean, you had the publication of a very vocal editorial against the hukou system. An editorial which was published by 13 Chinese newspapers, and again, just to remind you of the fact that the freedom of the press is very far from being guaranteed in the PRC. And the point that I would like to make here is that the argument used to support this critique against the hukou system was the Chinese constitution. And let me read what this editorial stated at the time. The constitution stipulates that the citizens of the PRC are all equal before the law, that the nation respects and protects human rights. This is uh, this uh, uh, amendment to the Chinese constitution of 2004, which I mentioned earlier, and that the citizens' personal freedoms will not be infringed upon. Freedom of movement is an inseparable component of human rights and personal freedom. It is a basic right that the constitution bestowed to the people. However, the current household registration policy, the hukou system, has created unequal statuses among urban residents and between urban residents and peasants, constraining the Chinese citizens' freedom of movement. All laws and administrative and local regulations must not contradict the constitution. This is the legal basis for accelerating the current reforms of the household registration system. So you see here a kind of constitutionalization of certain issues, or in a certain way, the constitution feeding into a process of dissent or a posture of dissent, in this case, without much success, in the sense that this editorial was removed from the website of those 30 newspapers after a few hours. So not much impact, but still indeed this idea of the constitution giving or feeding some arguments into a process of dissent, uh, uh, which can have indeed a variety of uh, implications, very often uh, unsuccessful in the Chinese context. But the point that I would like to make here is indeed the fact that the lack of constitutionalism does not mean that one should not take seriously uh, in the sense the constitution in the sense of the constitution also being an instrument for constitutional activism or indeed for people to engage with the Chinese uh, legal uh, system. Let me now say a few words about the uh, um, uh, third uh, challenge which I would like uh, to mention here, uh, um, uh, the challenge of judicial independence. I mean, during many years, I mean, uh, Chinese judges were still suffering from a uh, law education level. I mean, this is a problem which has been now very much uh, removed. Uh, um, corruption is definitely still an issue, and here we may want to come back uh, as part of the Q&A to the anti-corruption campaign, which has been going on in China since uh, 2013, anti-corruption campaign, which does not only have implications within China, but which also has many implications in terms of China engaging with the rest of the world. China indeed now tries to secure the adoption of extradition agreements, uh, extradition agreements which aim to indeed uh, 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 be able to, which aim indeed to ensure that the PRC can reach out to those people uh, the PRC identifies as being corrupt when those people have left, I mean, uh, the Chinese territory. Uh, you may be interested in the fact that a number of uh, EU member states do have an extradition agreement uh, with the PRC. Uh, Belgium uh, is uh, one of them. Uh, um, I've been very much involved, I mean, in the debates and uh, trying indeed to raise the risks uh, and implications uh, in terms of human rights protection that the adoption of such an extradition agreement uh, may uh, uh, implicate. Uh, uh, and in that regard, those of you who follow, I mean, Belgian law and Belgian politics, you may have uh, noticed the fact that the draft resolution was submitted to the Belgian parliament uh, by uh, some uh, members of the Belgian parliament in view of uh, suspending or even terminating, I can't recall whether it's a suspension request or termination request, the extradition agreement with the PRC in view of recent developments uh, in Hong Kong, uh, developments in Hong Kong to which I would also like to come back uh, during the second hour. 
uh, in order for you to understand uh, the challenge of judicial independence, I also find it useful to refer to the existence of so-called adjudication committees, Adjudica adjudication committees, uh, 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 which are whose role and functions are defined by Article 36 to 39 of the Organic Law of the People's Court. Uh, Article 60 to 36 to 39 of the Organic Law of the People's Court, which states that adjudication committees uh, should indeed uh, contribute to deliberating and deciding on the application of laws in major difficult and complicated cases. So the idea of, uh, of those adjudication committees is that you have some judges from the same court, but who did not attend the proceedings, who did not attend the hearings to give their opinion on the case. And those opinions have in a certain way to be taken into account by the judges, by the judge or the, uh, 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 or the, the panel of judges will have at the, at the end of the day to rule on the case. So just to, explain how how this works i mean i just would like to uh, um to to refer to a description which has made which has been made of those adjudic adjudication committees by a chinese judge i mean in a book published by uh, Li Yuan from rotterdam university back in 2014 which is still to date the best uh, introduction to the Chinese judicial system published uh, in English by Routledge, if I'm not mistaken, and who described indeed the uh, uh, function and role of the adjudication committee as follows. A specific responsible judge reports a case orally, and even though the reported contents may not reflect the true facts of a case, one can hardly discover or correct them. Some responsible judges take a long time to report all the details without a clear order, and members of the adjudication committee ask questions repeatedly, which results in protracted meetings. The oral report and the fact that members of the adjudication committee comment immediately without time to study the case and the relevant laws means that the quality of the decision cannot be guaranteed. Sometimes the decision of the adjudication committee is changed later by the same committee. So you can see here a process in which you have individual judges or individuals who are involved in the judicial proceedings without having heard the case. Now you may ask yourself, but why? I mean, why the hell? I mean, was that put in place? I mean, the main uh, uh, um, the main reason for that was originally, I mean, to act as a barrier against corruption, so to have some kind of external scrutiny over, I mean, the work of individual judges or panels of judges uh, who have to deliberate on difficult cases. And there was also very much this, uh, this Chinese idea of collective wisdom, namely that it was better indeed for individual judges or panel of judges to get the advice or more senior of more senior judges who were part of the same court. Now, obviously, I mean, the direct consequence of that from a rule of law perspective is the fact that you have individuals who have not taken part to the court's hearings who can directly interfere in the court's uh, final decision, which has led indeed to the adoption of the opinions of the SPC, of the Supreme People's Court, on improving the working mechanism of the Adjudication Committee, uh, which was adopted by the SPC back in 2019. And the idea of, uh, these, uh, of this opinion is indeed to require the decision made by the Adjudication Committee and the grounds thereof on the case to be made public and to be included in uh, the court uh, decision. So there is this idea in a certain way to add some kind of transparency to what was very much until then a black box, a black box in the sense that it was very difficult to know the extent to which uh, the adjudication committee had been had shaped the actual content of a court uh, decision. I would suggest um, that we make a short break uh, a short break of uh, uh, five minutes, so we will resume at uh, uh, ten past uh, at ten past ten, and then uh, we will continue. And again, as I said, I just would like to make sure that we have some time for discussion at the end. So let's uh, uh, gather together uh, in six minutes. Thank you very much.
Okay, I would suggest that we start again. Uh, um, Melanie, could you please just confirm that everyone can hear me properly? Yeah. Yeah, and we can hear you perfectly. <laughs> oh, 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 good, perfect. Thank you. I mean, that's the issue with this online environment. <laughs> uh, I cannot see your faces. So thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. So uh, let me continue, I mean, the kind of mapping of what I would identify as the challenges of the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective. The next one of which is uh, the um, challenge of uh, law implementation and law enforcement and uh, the weak compliance which exists uh, uh, in view of a number of different uh, areas uh, of law. Uh, I just would like here to take uh, the example of uh, uh, environmental law to kind of illustrate uh, my uh, argument here. Uh, environmental law, which is, and the fight against climate change, um, uh, as you know, I mean, China has very often been criticized, I mean, for not uh, doing uh, enough in terms of uh, uh, reducing its emission of uh, greenhouse gas uh, in view of uh, um, in, in view of fight, in view of the fight against climate change. I mean, those critiques uh, became I mean less vivid when uh, uh, the Trump administration withdrew from the Paris Agreement, and that China actually appeared as one of the main driving forces behind. I mean, uh, uh, the, the actual success, at least uh, in terms of uh, support. Uh, uh, to and of the uh, uh, Paris Agreement uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, but just to say that, I mean, very often, I mean, sometimes those critiques uh, uh, are indeed legitimate and China is indeed a major uh, polluter at uh, uh, on the worldwide scale. Uh, that being said, it is also very important to recognize the fact that China has adopted a very large panel of uh, um, laws aimed uh, at protecting uh, the environment. Uh, covering a very wide range of issues from uh, water pollution to the protection of marine environment and atmospheric uh, pollution. An important environmental law was also adopted in uh, 2014 uh, by the People's Republic of China. And the kind of argument which I would like to put forward here is that if we want to understand, I mean, the, the, the issues uh, in, the, uh, in the area of environmental law in China, the problems are more to be found in terms of the lack of proper implementation and enforcement of existing laws than in the legislation itself. I mean, just to quote here the uh, China University of Political Science and Law, uh, Professor Wang Jin, uh, uh, who stated that laws without regulation, troops without power, duties without action, this is the final assessment of and the current state of environmental law in China. Laws without regulations, troops without power, duties without action, this is the current state of environmental law in China. So what I would like to try to explain now is why, I mean, in the particular area of environmental law, we do witness such a huge gap between the law as it stands uh, in the books and what has been defined as the law in action. Um, the law in action, which is the idea that the law should be properly implemented or enforced if the law is indeed to be uh, uh, instrumental and, and influential in governing a particular society. And if we want to understand the weak uh, compliance records in the area of environmental law in China, it is important, I think, to bear in mind three different factors. The first one is that central authorities and local stakeholders, uh, local stakeholders who include, I mean, judges, but which also include party leaders who operate at the local level, might have interests uh, uh, at cross purposes. Interests at cross purposes in the sense that uh, 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 those local leaders, those part, local party leaders might have different interests to those who indeed put forward and adopted those pieces of legislation at central level uh, in Beijing. And for us to understand the gap which sometimes exists between the interest of uh, central authorities and local party leaders, it is important to have regard, I think, to the very system which can get local leaders promoted within the Chinese Communist Party. So the, the reason, and that's the kind of claim that I would like to make here, the reason behind implementation failure 
is not that much the result of a lack of central control, but this is rather an outcome of the centers of the central uh, uh, CCP own policy, own policies. So it is the very system which enables local stakeholders, local party leaders to elevate themselves in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party, which very often explains those huge gaps which exist between the center and uh, those more local areas. How do you elevate yourself in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party? You need to take exams, but you also need to reach objectives. Those objectives are very often ranked in terms of priorities. And over many years, I mean, the ranking has been informally pretty similar. First of all, have you contributed to economic growth? Secondly, have you been able to secure or to promote social stability, meaning the absence of protest in your area? And last but not least, but last, have you been able to contribute to protect the environment? I don't need to explain at length the impact that economic growth can have on environmental pollution and climate change. And in that sense, I don't need to explain at length that it sometimes makes sense as a local stakeholder, as a local party leader to prioritize certain objectives such as economic growth over indeed some other objectives such as the protection of the environment for the purpose indeed of getting promoted within the party apparatus. A second kind of uh, 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 factor which explains the gap between the law in the books and the law in action in the particular context of uh, environmental law is what you can call the compensation trap the compensation trap uh, in which fall a number of citizens which would rather prefer, I mean, getting some money directly from the company who has, which has contributed, let's say, to the pollution of the river, I mean, uh, uh, down the street, rather than bringing a claim to court. So indeed, many environmental disputes in China have been resolved outside uh, the court system, and uh, this is caused to a large extent by this so-called uh, 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 compensation trap. And uh, last but not least, obviously, you still have the issue of corruption, uh, which is particularly uh, strong in the field of environmental law, where indeed the economic and social power of private companies can surpass the quest for achieving public goods. So as you can see, a number of factors in the area of environmental law, this is the example I took to explain this weak implementation and enforcement records of Chinese law, which is indeed one of those challenges which I wanted to flag as part of uh, 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 those challenges of the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective. L Another point which uh, is also uh, uh, particularly important, and this leads me to make, let's say, some more general considerations of China's own governance system, which is often described, uh, sometimes for good reason, as being uh, heavily centralized. Here, what I still would like to flag are, is uh, the significant decentralization of China's governance uh, in a number of policy and legal fields. And just to illustrate, I mean, the need, I mean, for such decentralization of decision making of uh, legal and political practices to take place uh, is by showing you the very different realities which still characterize the People's Republic of China these days. I mean, those pictures are pictures I took, I mean, some time ago, I mean, uh, for uh, those of you who know uh, how uh, Pudong, so the financial district of uh, Shanghai uh, looks like these days, I mean, you have an additional uh, tower there, which has been built there in the meantime. So uh, you can see at the bottom left, I mean, uh, 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 Pudong, which is the financial district of Shanghai, uh, top, uh, top left, uh, you can see the entrance of the Forbidden City, uh, top right, you can see uh, a picture from a uh, at the border between uh, uh, Xinjiang, between the People's Republic of China and Pakistan on the Karakoram Highway. I mean, you are next to the K2 uh, uh, mountain there. And at the bottom right, you can see a typical village from the southern part of Tibet. 
needless to say that, I mean, those different areas of China, I mean, testify to different realities, different realities, which very often require new different policies or even different laws or regulations uh, to be applied. So let's not also underestimate the importance of decentralization as being an important component if we want to understand the nature of uh, the Chinese uh, legal system. Now, I would like to say a few words about some more recent developments. And for me to be able to uh, uh, talk about those uh, recent uh, internal developments, it is important to emphasize the fact that the party state, as uh, uh, I will call it from now on, is very much as a starting point. And this is not, uh, this is, these are not my words. I mean, Xi Jinping himself said in 2017, that socialism with Chinese characteristics has now entered a new era. And what I would like to try to describe now is what is this new era made of and what are its implications from, for the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective. So this is what I would like to spell out now. So why a turning point? I mean, first of all, internally, it is recognized that China, I mean, is facing and has been facing a number of challenges which now need to be addressed uh, as a matter of uh, urgency. Um, those challenges pertain to the relationship between economics and politics. Uh, uh, there's been a debate on the reform of China's state on enterprises for years now. I mean, nothing has materialized yet. Uh, as you may have seen, this has nevertheless not been an obstacle for the European Union and China to uh, uh, conclude, I quote, in principle, a comprehensive agreement on investment, which was concluded at the end of 2020, an agreement on which I would be happy to come back in the Q&A, if you like, because this is a topic on which I've been working on uh, quite extensively recently. Um, the question also of the sustainability of the rapid economic growth uh, trajectory of the PRC. I mean, here, uh, uh, I must confess, I wrote this slide uh, uh, last year pre-COVID. And uh, at the time, I didn't know that all of us, uh, all, most Western countries would be actually facing uh, such uh, uh, an economic drawback in the context of uh, uh, COVID and with China indeed be, having still been able to sustain a, rapid and significant economic growth, even in the midst of the pandemic. But indeed, also uh, another very important issue, which is the one of income, income inequality and economic disparities. I mean, the divide between the rural areas and urban areas was already mentioned. I would also mention, I mean, the divides between the coastal areas and the more remote parts of China, and also in a certain way, the divide between the uh, Han, uh, the Han ethnic majority of the country and uh, the uh, um, 55 ethnic minorities, which are recognized by the uh, Chinese uh, constitution. And also another challenge uh, to which I will come back in a minute, which is the one of the increased concentration of power. I mean, China has been a one party state ever since the creation of the People's Republic of China back in 1949. But what we've witnessed uh, since uh, uh, Xi Jinping came into power uh, in 2013 was in is indeed the idea of uh, a greater concentration of power and the idea of a decision making process which is less consensus based than it was at the very least uh, in comparison with uh, the former uh, presidency of the PRC under the leadership of Hu Jintao, whose, whose name I've just written here on the chat. Sorry, I've just sent it only to Melanie. That was not the purpose. So Hu Jintao, whose name you can now see here on uh, the uh, chat. So this is, let's say, for those internal aspects, which makes me think, which make me think that China is at a turning point. Now, externally, it is also very important to flag the fact that uh, uh, there is a momentum. There is a momentum which you which you can characterize as the crisis of the post World War II liberal international order a crisis which has two dimensions, one of legitimacy in the sense that the key institutions at the heart of the post-World War II liberal international order are increasingly challenged or see their legitimacy questioned, 
questioned. We've seen that in the context of the International Monetary Fund. We've seen that in the context of the uh, uh, World Trade Organization, uh, by the way, which has, uh, uh, which has uh, now a new director uh, since uh, yesterday. So let's see whether uh, this new uh, director uh, will be able to save the World Trade Organization in a certain way. But this crisis of legitimacy, which does not only have a uh, institutional component, but also very much a normative component with the very values at the heart of this post-World War II liberal international order being increasingly questioned, not only from the outside of this order, but also from the inside. And maybe that some of you have uh, followed the news in Poland and Hungary uh, in recent years with those situations of so-called rule of law backsliding and the idea that some politicians such as Viktor Orban, I mean, do not hesitate to call for the uh, establishment of illiberal states uh, in Europe, despite indeed the legal obligations of Hungary under uh, EU treaties, and in particular here, obviously, Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union, but also momentum in terms of the crisis of effectiveness of uh, global governance institutions, so the fact that uh, international organizations have been really struggling to, in a certain way, address some of the main global challenges that we are facing, from global poverty to global climate change to global migration and, and so on and so forth. So in that way, there are a number, we are at a turning point internally within China, but also we should not underestimate the impact of the overall context in which uh, China evolves. Now, China being at a turning point, uh, uh, a socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, having now entered a so-called new era, to quote Xi Jinping. Now, what uh, has it meant uh, in practice? Uh, this, uh, 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 this new era has been described as an authoritarian revival or the end of an era end of an era making reference indeed to the end of what was described until then as the opening up and reforms process. Uh, I'm here quoting a very good book. I mean, if you like uh, to have a good introduction to what can be meant by this authoritarian revival in China, I would advise you to look at this book by Charles uh, by uh, Karl, Karl Minzner, which was published by OUP back in 2018. It's a good book for lawyers. There are no footnotes, so um, or a very limited number of footnotes, so, so it's kind of easy to, to, to read it. Uh, um, so I would really strongly recommend it, strongly recommend it to all of you. So what have we witnessed as part of this authoritarian, authoritarian revival? As I said, an enhanced concentration of power under Xi Jinping, uh, the best example, kind of illustration of it, from a constitutional law perspective is indeed the 2018 amendment of the Chinese constitution to which I've already made a reference to. Also the idea of repartyization of Chinese politics, not to say that the Chinese Communist Party had disappeared, but has really come back to the forefront of Chinese politics under Xi Jinping. I would also like to make reference here to a number of uh, laws which have been adopted by the PRC aimed at protecting national interests, uh, whatever that means. Um, uh, happy to come back to a number of those laws. I've been also working on them recently, including on the cybersecurity law, the national intelligence law. Um, you've had also the adoption of the national security law, the 2016 of the law of the People's Republic of China on the administration of activities of overseas NGOs, adoption of the law which has made, made it increasingly difficult for foreign civil society organizations to operate uh, in the PRC with even more admin, administrative burdens being imposed upon them as the kind of process leading to them being authorized to operate uh, in the People's Republic of China. We've seen also an increasing, increasingly vocal opposition to so-called uh, universal uh, values. Uh, I would just like here to refer to an intra-party document, the so-called Document 9, which is the 2013 communique on the current state of the ideological sphere uh, in China, uh, 2013 communique on the current state of the ideological sphere in China, which makes reference to uh, the so-called perils, perils which China is facing these days, uh, including in terms of uh, uh, China being uh, influenced by ideas of Western constitutional democracy, being influenced by idea, foreign ideas of civil society, and so on and so forth, and calling in a certain way the party, the Chinese Communist Party, to 
fight back against those so-called uh, universal uh, values. And what we very much witnessed in, indeed since 2013 is very much a shrinking space for debate and dissent. I mean, civil society organizations have always had a limited space uh, in the PRC uh, post uh, opening up and reform, so post 1970s, but this space has been very much shrinking uh, in recent years. Um, I would also like to flag uh, what has been going on uh, in Xinjiang ever since 2017 with the, uh, um, with the establishment of those uh, detention uh, of those detention or so-called re-education camps in the northwestern province of Xinjiang. Uh, numbers do vary depending on accounts, but it would be between uh, uh, 1 million and 2 million uh, uh, um, individuals. Uh, most of them coming from the Uyghur uh, uh, Muslim minority which who have been put in those camps against their will, uh, camps in which uh, 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 have been reported, I mean, uh, practices of torture, forced sterilization, uh, um, uh, and, and so on, and uh, to torture, forced sterilization, and so on, uh, and forced detention, forced labor, and many others. Uh, leading a number of uh, uh, foreign states uh, calling the situation in Xinjiang uh, uh, crimes against humanity uh, uh, for the least or even uh, genocides. And you may have uh, uh, seen in The uh, Economist this week that there was an interesting article explaining why, according to The Economist, uh, why what's going on in Xinjiang would not be a genocide. But just to say that there is a heavy debate on what is going on in Xinjiang, uh, heavy debate which was very visible at the time of China's uh, midterm, uh, 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 at China's, not midterm, sorry, at the occasion of China's uh, universal periodic review uh, before the UN uh, Human Rights Council. A UN Human Rights Council, which has indeed raised, uh, uh, in which a number of uh, states raised the issue of Xinjiang as an area of significant concern in terms of the actual state of uh, human rights in the People's Republic of China. You also had, back, into, uh, back in June 2020, the adoption of uh, Hong Kong uh, national uh, security law, uh, Hong Kong national security law, which introduced, I mean, broadly defined crimes of secession, Article 20, subversion, Article 22, and ter terrorist activities, Article uh, 24, uh, uh, a law which has an extraterritorial, uh, which has a number of extraterritorial effects, uh, meaning that uh, um, uh, uh, what I'm saying here uh, is indeed submitted to uh, the uh, to, to, to the 2020 uh, Hong Kong national security law and governed uh, by it. Quite interestingly, the uh, Hong Kong national security law does not include any principle of uh, dual criminality, which is a basic, a basic principle normally of uh, international criminal law, namely the fact that you can, uh, uh, in order for a criminal law to have some extraterritorial implications, uh, the law of the state where the individual is located should also identify this act as a crime. Uh, this is, by the way, something which is recognized by the criminal law of the People's Republic of China, but the principle of dual criminality, which is not included in Hong Kong uh, national security law of uh, 2020. So as you can see, a number of uh, developments uh, uh, in recent years, uh, uh, to which, again, I would be happy to come back uh, during the uh, Q&A. Um, another point uh, which I feel like it is important uh, to mention when I talk about uh, a shrinking space for dissent, a shrinking space for civil society organizations to operate, I just would like here to flag for your information a crackdown which has been going on uh, going on since July uh, 2019, a uh, crackdown particularly targeting uh, individual uh, uh, human rights lawyers or human rights academics. Uh, uh, um, you can see here, uh, for instance, Teng Biao, uh, who now lives uh, in uh, Canada, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and uh, who's uh, among and whose experience of uh, this crackdown of July 2019, together with a number of other uh, human rights uh, law professors or constitutional law professors, by the way, uh, uh, have been described uh, by uh, Eva Pils, will be, if I'm not mistaken, one of the contributors to this course of Chinese law as being as follows. In China, we say that 
for a person med med meditating in a cave, a day passes as though it were a thousand years. It is like paradise. And where did I experience paradise? In there, in the detention center, being tortured. A day was like a thousand years. That's how it felt. I mean, I really recommend you for if you want to know more about what has been going on in terms of this so-called 709 crackdown to indeed uh, have regard to this book published by Eva, uh, Eva Pills back in 2017. Now, just a few words, and before I turn back uh, to you on uh, uh, the external dimension of what I've been uh, discussing here. So I've been primarily talking about internal development. I just would like to sh flag the fact that China, that the party state is becoming increasingly active in trying to shape, uh, uh, shake or make international norms. So China was very much until very recently a norms taker or could be described as a norms taker when uh, China's influence uh, on international law was concerned. Now we can see a number of attempts of China to shape, shake or make international norms. And uh, this is clearly part of a, a, a process which was started in 2014, again, at the occasion of the same plenum with the CCP Central Committee emphasizing its commitment, I quote, to strengthen foreign related legal work and vigorously participate in the formulation of international norms, promote the handling of foreign related economic and social affairs according to the law, strengthen our country's discourse power. I mean, for those of you who come from France who have read a little bit of Foucault, there is very much this uh, Foucault type of idea that language, that discourse is power. And if you have indeed the ability to shape the language and to shape the discourse at international level that you've been in able to increase your power successfully, a good example of China's successful use of its discourse power is in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, which I'm sure you will address later on in this course. And then to finish indeed the quote, an influence in international legal affairs and use legal methods to safeguard our country's sovereignty, security, and development interests. So a very clear commitment to shape uh, international norms. Uh, just an illustration thereof, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which relates to uh, China's actions in the context of the UN uh, human Rights uh, Council. I mean, for your information, China has just been uh, re-elected for a mandate as part of the uh, UN uh, Human Rights uh, Council, uh, in which it has been very clear that uh, China has been trying to, I quote, uh, Sophia Richardson here, who is the China, the China director at Human Rights Watch, who argued back in 2020 that Chinese authorities are trying to rewrite norms and manipulate existing procedures, not only to minimize scrutiny of the Chinese conducts of the Chinese government's conduct, but also to achieve the same for all governments. And in that regard, I just would like to refer to um, exchanges of letters which have been taking place in the context of the UN Human Rights Council in the last um, two years, exchange of opposing letters on the situation in Xinjiang and on the situation in Hong Kong, with indeed pro-China members of the UN Human Rights Council signing and supporting China's policies in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, in particular in view of the principles of sovereignty and non-intervention. And on the other side, I mean, some other letters uh, have primarily been submitted by European uh, countries, EU member states, and the United States aim to criticize, indeed, uh, in particular, uh, human, China's human rights records uh, in those two uh, regions. Just to say that uh, uh, it's also important to have regard to, to be uh, 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 um, to, to be nuanced enough when we talk about China's growing influence in the UN Human Rights Council, uh, uh, both actually from an institutional perspective and from a norms uh, 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 shaping or shaking type of perspective. Uh, first of all, it is clear that there has been a declining support for China's membership in the UN Human Rights Council. Back in 2016, when China was elected, you had 180 votes in favor of China's membership. In the UN Human Rights Council, you only had 139 votes uh, in favor. That being said, uh, I just would like uh, to flag here that uh, China has just been appointed to one of the five seats of the so-called consultative group of the UN Human Rights Council. A consultative group of the uh, UN Human Rights Council, which has an important role in appointing 
uh, advisors and investigators who work on behalf of the United Nations. And in the course of uh, this uh, Chinese membership of the consultative group of the UN Human Rights Council, uh, China will get the chance to shape and shake or make the appointment of uh, global monitors of on freedom of speech, health, and forced disappearances and arbitrary detention. Just to say that this is something which is likely to be quite influential in the years to come. So this is for the institutional dimension in terms of uh, the more norms making point of view. There has been what you could call also a declining support for a number of draft resolutions which have been proposed by China to the UN Human Rights Council. In particular, uh, China has been very keen to promote the idea of mutually beneficial cooperation in the field of human rights mutually beneficial cooperation in the field of human rights, which is deeply encoded uh, uh, around the protection of the principles of sovereignty and non-intervention, meaning that any kind of human rights monitoring of human rights records of individual states is very much difficult according to this conception of international human rights law. But here again, we have witnessed uh, a declining support for those draft resolutions to a point that the last resolution that China was submitted was uh, withdrawn before before it was put uh, to a vote uh, before the UN Human Rights Council. So this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, 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 this kind of external dimension. Just a few words uh, to conclude uh, before having 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, we can call, and here the idea is not to give you definite answers, but I just would like to give you some kind of, uh, kind of toolbox uh, in a way for you to try to understand what the Chinese legal system is about uh, from a rule of law perspective, it is also to understand what it is not about. And my recommendation would be for you to bear that in mind when you will get to study some specific areas of Chinese law. The first point that I would like to make is that Chinese legal system can be characterized as a multiple speed legal system. Uh, this is very much an argument which I use in my book uh, on uh, uh, um, the Chinese perspectives on the international rule of law, law and politics of the one party state, um, but also an argument which Donald Clark put in a very eloquent way uh, back in 2011 when he stated that the Chinese, Chinese legal system is about the effective functioning of functioning of government or the party, I would add. So when the system changes, it does so to help government function better. This does not mean it cannot also develop to better accommodate issues arising between citizens that have little connection to the government, but it does that on the side. The fundamental characteristics of the system stem from its statist orientation. So statist orientation. Law stability paradox is still very much there in China. What was meant by the law stability paradox uh, when uh, John Liebman uh, uh, wrote about it by, back in 2011 is the idea that the law constitutes both a risk and a need from the perspective of the party state. Namely, and in particular, if you think of areas around, I mean, private law, protection of foreign investments and so on, there is a need for legal certainty and for China to sustain its vast economic growth, there is a need to have a good legal system in place. At the same time, obviously, I mean, the law is also about individual rights, whether you like it or not. And there are a number of individual rights which are protected by the Chinese legal system. And there you can see that the law itself can also be a challenge from the perspective of stability. So in a way, the, the law is both a useful instrument in the hand of the party as much as it does constitute a risk or a threat to the one party state. We are very far from a rule of law being a thin or a thick rule of law. It's even more true, I mean, in recent years. A rule by law is also uh, a, a, an instrument uh, description which has been used. So this idea of the law being a mere instrument in the, in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. Last but not least, don't underestimate the rise and the importance of China's discourse power. Uh, uh, its impact on international law has been described by uh, Tom Ginsburg as being uh, one of the ways, one of uh, uh, the sources of influence of what has become, according to him, an authoritarian version of international law, an authoritarian version of international law, which would not only be promoted by China, but also by Russia, but also, as I mentioned it earlier, by a number of states, uh, uh, um, such as Hungary or Poland, who have been increasingly active in shaping, in proposing alternative visions of 
not only the institutions, but also the values, which were very much at the heart for very often applied uh, in an hypocritical way after the Second World War. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I hope it was not too much. I know there were many elements uh, in this lecture. The idea was to give you a kind of mapping of what I would identify as being the main challenges of the Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective to try to flag some recent developments which have to be taken into account if you want to understand what China is, what China is not. Developments which also have implications uh, at the external level. And last but not least, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. And my recommendation will always be the same. If you want to learn more about China, you made the right choice by taking this course. But the best choice you will ever make is just go there. Thank you. So if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or use a chat box. We'll just wait a, a minute to see if there are any questions. Don't hesitate to raise your hand freely. I mean, it's it's even nicer if we can do this orally. I mean, obviously all fine to use the chat function, but always prefer to interact directly. Um, hi, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's on. great. Well, since no one was going ahead, I thought I'd go ahead and ask about um, Xi's campaign against corruption. Um, how much of that is a genuine fight against real corruption? And how much of it is she just going after political enemies or competitors? Oh, I think you're still on mute, uh, Mathieu. My apologies. This is this is the phrase of 2020 and 2021, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? So I can collect maybe one or two questions uh, uh, and try to answer them simultaneously. But many thanks for your question, Elise. Any other question at this stage? For you? I also had a, a, maybe a question that could be interesting. Um, you raised uh, several laws or newly or recently adopted new laws in the Chinese legal system that also include an extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction clause. And I was wondering um, if you know if the, we've already seen repercussions on, on that or, or what we can not fear, but what we can expect from that kind of just a bit of background on that. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me maybe uh, uh, start with those two questions. And again, many thanks, uh, Elise and, and Melanie, for, for those two questions. Um, let's say, to answer your question, Elise, that there is a little bit of both. I mean, there is a little bit of a genuine commitment to fight against corruption in a context in which corruption has been an endemic problem in China for decades, and I would even say for centuries. I mean, corruption was also a huge issue uh, when China was still an empire. Uh, being at the time of the Qing dynasty uh, or uh, before. Uh, that uh, being said, uh, uh, um, the fight against corruption has also been very much used uh, by Xi Jinping. Uh, sorry, and again, on the, first, on the first point, it has been recognized by the Chinese Communist Party, not only by Xi Jinping, but also before him by Hu Jintao, that the very high level of corruption in China uh, uh, was putting the legitimacy uh, of the Chinese Communist Party at threat. So there has been an open and public recognition of the fact that the uh, high level of corruption in China uh, was putting the uh, uh, legitimacy of the CCP at threat. That being said, and, and, and it is very clear uh, uh, also that the fight against corruption has been uh, uh, um, very much used as a kind of instrument uh, to concern uh, uh, she's uh, uh, power. And here, uh, probably that the most uh, high profile case was the one of uh, uh, Bo Xilai. Uh, Bo Xilai uh, was the mayor of the big city of Chongqing. And you may have indeed uh, followed in the news uh, a couple of years ago that there was a high 
profile uh, entire corruption case against Bo Xilai, who was very much seen as the main competitor of uh, Xi Jinping within the party. Uh, not to say that Bo Xilai was not a corrupt uh, official, to be honest, I don't know, and uh, I don't even care, but just from a rule of law perspective, indeed, uh, it, is, it is very clear that the way in which this corruption case uh, has been dealt with was very far from the rule of law, and indeed, has been a useful instrument to kind of uh, consolidate uh, this ongoing concentration of power uh, uh, in the hands of a limited number of individuals uh, in China's governance system uh, these days. Kind of follow up question to that, uh, uh, if I may, is uh, Elise is also how are those corruption cases being dealt with and uh, uh, to a large extent uh, corruption case uh, um, Corrupt officials, I mean, have been dealt with uh, outside the Chinese judicial system for a number of years. I mean, there have been some attempts recently in a certain way to bring back in a certain way uh, the fight against corruption under the remits of the Chinese judicial system. But the party, uh, the, the people, the, the uh, Chinese Communist Party also has its, its own disciplinary procedures, uh, its own disciplinary procedures, which very much take place outside the uh, jurisdiction and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the and outside the Chinese uh, judicial system. Uh, um, when whenever there is a kind of external uh, a foreign element to those uh, corruption cases, just to take again the example of those many officials who have now left the PRC and tried to seek uh, refuge outside uh, ju the jurisdiction of the PRC, and there are many of them. I mentioned uh, in the lecture uh, the fact indeed that China um, has adopted a number, has really tried to uh, 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 adopt a number of law enforcement, uh, of law enforcement instruments, uh, law enforcement instruments, including with uh, EU member states. And, uh, uh, um, and with, with the very question indeed of the uh, potential implications also in terms of human rights protections that the very adoption of those extradition agreements can have uh, when you enter in such agreements uh, with the PRC. Uh, on your question on extraterritoriality, uh, 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 Melanie, uh, so, so just to put it that way, I mean, the Chinese criminal law has had uh, uh, an extraterritorial, as has strong extraterritorial uh, uh, component. You have uh, two conditions. I mean, foreseen uh, by the uh, um, by the Chinese uh, legal system. If you are a Chinese national uh, who is, uh, uh, um, if you are a Chinese national who lives outside uh, China's jurisdiction. Uh, um, this, th th what is considered to be a crime also has to be considered as a crime in the uh, jurisdiction where you are based. The same applies if you are not a Chinese citizen, but there is also a requirement for a minimum, uh, for a minimum sentence, which is applied for those who are not Chinese citizen, which is, I think, a minimum of three years of uh, 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 imprisonment as the ultimate criminal sentence for this extraterritorial uh, component to be applied. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, the principle of dual criminality is not included in the national security law. I mean, some uh, mainland Chinese law scholars, I mean, have said that the dual criminality principle is not included textually, but that it will be applied in practice. Uh, obviously, this is still an open question at this stage, but it is at least not in the text of the law. I would say that it's here important to go beyond uh, what you could call a legalistic, I mean, type of understanding of this extraterritorial component. I think that the main impact, and I'm here talking primarily about the impact that it can have upon uh, uh, academic work and uh, um, academic freedom in a way, this will just lead to more self-censorship and self-censorship, which has been a significant issue uh, when uh, China-related work uh, is concerned uh, for a number of years. But indeed, this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, the, the principle of extraterritoriality included in the national security law of Hong Kong, I mean, provides yet an additional tool and in this sense, a legal one for the party state to extend its reach outside China's territory and outside China's borders. 
And this is very much something which has been very much clear uh, in recent years. Uh, and you may have, uh, some of you may have followed those uh, uh, high profile cases of uh, individuals who hold a dual nationality, like uh, Chinese and Canadian nationality or Chinese and Swedish nationality, individuals getting into trouble when they were kind of going back in China. And here I should emphasize the fact that China's uh, citizenship laws do not recognize the fact, uh, the principle of dual citizenship, mainly that if you have a Chinese citizenship, you will always be considered as Chinese by Chinese authorities, and you will never be able to use your uh, other, the other passports, uh, the other passport which you may hold. So as a way, just to answer your question, Melanie, I mean, it's difficult to find, uh, to identify, let's say, high profile cases in which this extraterritoriality principle has been applied in practice. Uh, uh, no cases yet in terms of the uh, national uh, security law of, of Hong Kong, but let's say that the, the implications beyond the very application of this law are, are already are already to be felt. Uh, that's that's for sure. Any other questions? Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Hilaria. Yes, I can. Well, I have just a question about the Xinjiang um, region. Uh, it, is it correct to say that what is going on in this region can be explained by economic reason? Uh, for instance, that Xinjiang is a crucial region for the new Silk Road, so they need stability. And it is more an economic reason than an ideological one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilaria. It's, it's a very good question. And, and indeed, if one wants to understand, I mean, what is going on in Xinjiang, it's very important to have a nuanced approach. And just would like to emphasize here for the sake of clarity and transparency. I mean, I've only been in Xinjiang once. Uh, it was four months and it was, uh, uh, it was 11 years ago. So I haven't had the chance to go back to that region ever since. So what my arguments are based on what I've read, what I've learned from other scholars, but I haven't been there for quite some time now. You're extremely right to, to emphasize the centrality of the geographic or uh, geographic location of Xinjiang and its geoeconomic importance uh, in view of the Belt and Road Initiative. Indeed, the Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Roads are not only about connecting China with the rest of the world, but the, it is also about enhancing the economic growth of some regions of China, such as Xinjiang, such as the southern province of Yunnan, uh, which had been very much uh, underdeveloped uh, until then. So the geoeconomic aspects, uh, the geoeconomic importance of Xinjiang is definitely one of them. And from the perspective of the Chinese government, there is a need for stability uh, in, that, in that respect. That's one point. The second point is if we want to understand what is going on in Xinjiang these days, it is very important uh, to have regard to a number of elements and, and not only to look at some recent developments. The actual policies of the Chinese government uh, in Xinjiang are to be situated against the background of a long history of uh, um, opposition and disagreement between policies adopted by the central level and the reality uh, and the, the reality the reality in Xinjiang uh, um, we we are we already i mean and it was uh, uh, you've had i mean a successive set of uh, 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 events which have been taking place either in Xinjiang i'm here referring for instance to the riots which took place in the summer of 2009, where you had a couple of hundreds of people who died. I mean, no international media coverage, uh, uh, but indeed there was already a massive, uh, um, massive protests with people dying, let's call it on both sides, both in terms of uh, people from the Uyghur minority dying and people from the Han majority dying. You've had also some uh, terrorist attacks. I mean, some terrorist attacks, I mean, uh, uh, conducted by uh, members of the uh, Uyghur uh, ethnic minority, including in the uh, uh, station of, uh, um, uh, it was in Kuenming, I think, in Yunnan, indeed, uh, uh, a few years after that. So there have been a succession, or, uh, a succession of events which have been described by Beijing as being instability, as being attempts of uh, uh, separatism. 
which actually leads me to the last point. That is the fact that if you want to understand what is going on in Xinjiang, it is also important to situate it against the background of what I would call the disastrous, I mean, uh, minor, the disastrous policy of Beijing in terms of, uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, taking into account, I mean, the specificities of uh, uh, the minorities who live, uh, who live in those, uh, uh, the minority groups who live uh, in, those, uh, in those regions. Um, there, um, the, obviously now, I mean, we, we, are, we, we are really talking about uh, policies uh, of torture, mass detention, uh, forced sterilization, which we had not seen for years. But uh, for years, we have seen other processes, such as what you could call a process of Disney, Disneyification of uh, areas such as Xinjiang, in which you see, I mean, massive parts of uh, cultural sites, I mean, either being destroyed or being reconstructed uh, in a way which does not take into account the, 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 century long, the centuries long history of uh, those sites, and you have many of them in Xinjiang. So uh, you, you also need here to get, I think, into the details of also the ways in which the very urban space and the very uh, 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 urban space has been uh, 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 it's been changing in those cities of Xinjiang. I mean, and again, for, for those of you who will have the chance to go there, I can only recommend you to go to those fast, far, far, far remoted cities such as Kashgar, such as uh, Turufan, in which you really see, I mean, the very transformation of those cities from being, I mean, those old towns in which, which were very much the heritage of this long tradition of China being at the cornerstone, being at the corner of uh, world trade. I mean, when you go there, you see the Silk Roads, you see the Silk Roads, you, you witness them, and you witness that kind of history in a certain way. And those very cities, I mean, have been transformed, uh, uh, um, meaning that uh, uh, hundreds of mosques have been, described, uh, have been destroyed, hundreds of uh, uh, more traditional habitats have been destroyed, with the construction of uh, high high buildings outside, I mean the the remits of the cities, with people de facto also losing the possibility to practice their their job, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, it's it's very important to to situate to take a kind of global approach, Belt and Road Initiative to look at the uh, the kind of domestic dimension of the BRI, to situate it against the background of. A, long historical trend of dissent and of opposition uh, between Xinjiang and the center of power. And last but not least, indeed, to contextualize it against the background of Beijing's uh, minority, uh, minority policies in general. Um, I've seen we've gone over the clock, so I think this might bring us to our conclusion uh, already. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Mathieu, for uh, giving this course, and I'm very happy that we had the good fortune to have you kick off the course, um, because I think it's very important that uh, students are aware early on and have a background of the Chinese legal system. Um, you took us from how it was in its reconstruction phase, but also um, highlighted the various and numerous challenges the Chinese legal uh, system faces. Uh, so I think for students that this is a great way um, to start this course for the upcoming uh, 12 weeks so I think we have. Um, and always very importantly, keep uh, this context um, in the back of their minds. Uh, I think the reference uh, that Mathieu made to law on the books and law in practice is very important here. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we'll see um, different sub branches of law, both public and private law. Um, but it'll be very important to also think about what we see um, as provisions or individual rights in certain uh, Chinese domestic law that it might be different uh, in practice as well. So that's a very important uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, so thank you again, uh, Mathieu, for uh, uh, extending uh, or in taking on our invitation and uh, giving this great uh, course to kick off the Chinese law from European perspective. Many thanks again, Melanie, and many thanks to all of you for listening, but also and mainly to contribute to the q and it was, it was fun. So uh, don't hesitate. I mean, if you have any follow-up questions, I will write down my name on the chat, uh, my email address on the chat, so you have it. So don't hesitate. Don't hesitate to reach out and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy the rest of the course. Bye-bye. Thank you.